I don't care what anybody says. You're never going to stop learning. So any of these guys that pat themselves on the back, that know everything, they're just foolish. But it's always changing. You want to feel the difference. And when that rod tip is too stiff, that very subtle, different pull is indiscernible from those little taps. People will go up, they don't see bass popping, they make it a couple casts, they leave. But they don't take the time to try and figure out what's going on under the surface. You know, we'll sit there, do five of those drifts and not catch one fish and just go. They'll just keep going to the next spot, next spot. Right. Not me, I'm staying there. You know, you have that moment with all sorts of species of fish where you realize you are not the one that's got the upper hand in the fight, and I realized that very quickly. <laughs> uh, that fish, it, it took off, it dug my rod tip right into the water. Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Salt Strong live stream and podcast. My name is Rich Natoli. I'm the host of this Monday night and uh, I guess Monday night live, live stream and the Friday morning podcast. And we're going to go a little bit different. We're going to go back to what we did a few weeks ago where we did an Ask the Salt Strong Coach episode. And uh, we have, I'll bring them on screen right now. We have two of our awesome coaches here with us tonight. We have Matt and the Yak with eight rods so, in the back. And, uh, we have, I'll bring them on screen right and now. And we have Wyatt Parcell and Matt, you're covering what panhandle. We want to go through your area just for people that aren't familiar. Yeah, sure. I'm up here in uh, the panhandle area. Uh, I'm from Tallahassee. So I fish mostly uh, anywhere within two to three hours, east or west of uh, say Wakulla County panacea area. Uh, those are the areas that I cover most all the way down to steen Hatchie to Pensacola. All right, great. And Wyatt, uh, why don't you introduce yourself and go through the territories that you're covering? Yeah, so uh, I'm Wyatt Parcell. I cover the Texas coast for Salt Strong. I've fished all over the country, East Coast, uh, both sides of Florida, all around through Louisiana. And now I'm here uh, in Texas uh, covering the region. Um, I live in Corpus Christi, but again, I, I do fish up and down the coast here in Texas. Great. And for those that are unaware, uh, Rich Natoli, I am covering the mid Atlantic and the Northeast. And I am basically covering anywhere from Maryland, Delaware, New Jersey, New York, and up. Uh, so all along the coast and into the Chesapeake as well, uh, mainly the, the mid to upper Chesapeake Bay, but, uh, great to see you guys here. And the last time that we had an ask the coach live stream, we got a lot of questions. Uh, and it looks like we're, we've got, we've got a healthy crew in the chat. We've got, well, we've got a lot more people watching, but in the chat, we've got, uh, we got James Flynn, Bill, uh, brackish water, Tom, uh, Charlie, Charlie Ray. Ray. Yeah. I see Charlie Ray in there. Yeah, I mean, we short stack. We've got a bunch of them in there, and and can't see or see who's there unless you chat. So everybody else, hello and thank you for for swinging by. This is a, a pretty cool show, and when we talked about doing the first one, where it was just kind of opening it up from the the normal mid Atlantic uh, to cover really all of the the, the coaches, it was kind of like well. How well, I, I guess I guess normally it's it's the mid-Atlantic, right? And we were kind of talking like, well, what kind of interests are we going to get? And man, people went crazy last time with the questions. And we we luckily did get through, I think, about 85% of them. But what you're going to see and what you're going to get from these coaches tonight, everybody, is if you are not a Salt Strong Insider member, you're going to get a little bit of a flavor of the types of conversations that happen within the member group, the insider club. Um, so, you know, th this is stuff that they're doing that we're doing every day inside that club. And now it's open for everybody. So you've got one hour to ask your questions everywhere from Texas, all the way around through the Gulf and all the way up the East coast. And we'll do our best to answer everyone that we possibly can. And we're going to try to keep them fishing related. And we'll, we'll start there. So uh, I'm going to jump in and I'm going to answer the first question because it's going to be the easiest one. And uh, let's see. The question was, it was actually for me. And that's why I know it's going to be easy. And the question was to me, do I ever fish South Shore of Long Island? 
And I will say to Larry, uh, thanks for the question. I do fish Long Island. Um, Staten Island is, you know, I will say Staten Island is typical on the Raritan Bay. I'll be out off of Staten, Staten Island quite often, usually for striped bass. I do venture up there for flounder because or fluke because it opens earlier or traditionally has opened earlier in New York than in New Jersey. So I fish up there and I am planning multiple trips all the way up to the tip of Long Island uh, this this upcoming season. So, yeah, I, I do. I do fish in that area and I will be extending up even further north and actually have some tentative plans all the way up through Rhode Island. So we, we've got some some coverage there, uh, but we do have another question. And this one, we're just going to kind of kind of go around the horn. And I thought this is a, a good one that came up and let me put it up on the screen here. From Mike Schultz. Hello all. So what do you look for when picking the color of your bait? Matt, you want to take that one first? Yeah, I'll jump in first. Uh, first, right. first thing for me is water clarity. That's, that's number one for me, um, for sure. Uh, in my area, what I have is a lot of silty water. Now, what's clean for me is not what's clean for Wyatt. It's not what's clean for you. It's not what's clean for, say, uh, Luke in Tampa Bay area. My clean water is very different than, say, clean water for everybody else. So if I have what I consider clean water, which is normally silty and uh, can often be... Um, just a little, um, you know, tannic, uh, you know, I'm, I'm a big fan of the Fred color. Our, uh, Fred 2.0 paddle tail is probably what I throw 80% of the time, but, um, that, that pink color, uh, is just works really great in that, uh, tannic water. Um, so that's kind of what I gravitate towards, but as far as picking lure in, you know, uh, lure color, um, you know, water clarity is first, and then it would be, I guess, uh, light visibility from the sun. Um, and, um, uh, then I think, I think those are my two main factors. Why do you got anything else to add? Yeah, it's, I, I would agree with you hundred percent on water clarity. You know, is it, is it a stirred up sediment? Is the water just flat out dirty? Is it like tannic? There's a lot of different things that can go into water clarity. And, and I, I try to not, over complicate it too much. I usually go with, is it gin clear water? Is it, you know, moderate clarity or is it really dirty? Um, I, really, I think probably the water that I end up fishing the most is somewhere between moderate clarity and gin clear. And the biggest things I look at in that color of water, when it's, it's, you're not really having to adjust your color so that it even shows up because the, the clarity of the water can mask some of those colors when there's not enough light penetrating the surface. I start thinking about the bait that's in the area. For example, like a lure I've been fishing a lot recently, being that we're in trophy trout season, is a, a corky. And this looks like an odd color that uh, doesn't seem like a natural thing we'd see with fish. But when you think about what a uh, like what a trout would be eating or what my target species would be eating, this matches like a pinfish, which is a primary bait source for big trout in my area in the wintertime really well. They've got like purplish backs, silver bodies. So when I choose, you know, colors, if I'm in clear, moderate water, I try to match different bait profiles, different important hues that are on those fish, you know, some sort of contrast. This could be like a mullet right here in dirty water, dirtier water, chartreuse belly, black back, something that contrasts and brings out some of the hues of whatever it is I'm trying to, to mimic. Great answers. Uh, I will chime in for the mid-Atlantic and Northeast. Uh, I know that's a really wide area, but we don't have the gin clear water in 99.997% of the mid-Atlantic and Northeast. So clear for us might be, you know, I'm, I'm really excited about water clarity when I can see six feet. And, uh, you know, so, so I tend to go with the whites uh, with a little bit of glitter in them. The Slam Shady actually has that. It's it's like the white color with the flex in it right there. So you get a little bit of color, a little bit of flash. But um, I also like to use the darker colors. So things like greens with some flex in them. If I'm using gulp baits, I'm, I'm typically using, uh, believe it or not, the most natural of colors, the bubblegum pink. 
is one of them, but white is always my, my first go-to. So I, I'm typically looking at the whites, um, some of the darker, like the greens. And then, uh, if I'm going with gulp and it's really a scent or a taste, I guess it's scent really for gulp, then I'll use the brighter colors. And then at nighttime, I do like to use, uh, both extremes. I will use the pure blacks and dark purples. And then I will go all the way up to the, the, uh, bubble gum zoom color, the zooms, uh, this, the zoom flukes in the bubble gum color and whites. So again, pearls and slam shady colors for that. And, uh, I think if you just have those, you know, a pink, a white and a dark, you're pretty well covered, um, for most situations, whether it's night or day. So, so that's where I'm going with that. Um, that was a, that was a really good question. And that's one that I, let's be honest, we could have talked for hours on specifics, uh, for each one of them, but I'm over here having all my different lures to talk about contrast and every like, man, that would a that's a question for sure. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. All right. Let's see. Let's bring up this question here and why this one's directly for you from brackish water. Why it ever fished in Bay city, Texas. Yes. As yeah. Getting so, better. Uh, ever fish. i better yet i don't know if the better yet is it any better um yeah i fished a so that's like the matagorda waters that's slightly like the clarity is a little bit i'll say worse but you know it doesn't mean there's there's a uh, worse fishing up there in fact some of the best trout fishing in texas takes place in uh east matagorda bay so yeah i have fished there i've caught trout there i've gone red fishing there amazing system comprised of uh, mostly marshes and uh open giant flats it's crazy so um that's a, it's a really cool system. I've, I've published a couple reports over in, in uh, the Matagorda Bays. So um, yeah, I have fished over there for sure. All right. This one, I'd be interested to see Matt or why, if you want to jump in on this one, it's a little bit of a longer question from a question from current jam. I team normally targets stripers using 10 pound braid and can handle 40 to 50 pounds without an issue. What would you recommend when targeting tuna of the same size, 40 to 50 pounds? Have either of you had any experience tuna fishing in that, in that size class? Yeah. Um, I, I personally would say because they just hold a lot more power and there's a lot more, and especially if you're trying to move them around the like such short force that they can take off. Like you might have that 10 pound test and it can handle it fine for a redfish that's a slow drag, but the amount of snap that those fish could turn around, take off, and then it immediately straightens out that that 10 pound, it can pop it. I would, I would at least probably have 30 on there, just my personal opinion, uh, in the 40, 50 pound class for tunas. I don't know. Matt, what do you think? Yeah, I don't I don't have a whole lot of experience in that arena, but as soon as uh I read the last part of that question, which was tunas. Um, <laughs> my mind immediately switched from, oh, you know, 30 to, I mean, 40, 50. Um, because those two, just like Wyatt was saying, man, some of those tunas can, that they're so fast. They are so freaking fast. And the way that they uh, target other, uh, their bait, it's, it's just all speed. You know, they target their meals based on, you know, um, swarming them, confusing them by their speed. And you often have another, you know, you can find, I know that you can find like a, a bigger one in the pack. And, uh, you know, you, you hook up to one of those bigger ones, even that 30 pound test, um, they can break that stuff, man. Those are some really, really strong fish. You hook up to a 15 pound tuna, you find out how strong those fish are really quick, really quick. Yeah, I and I'll I'll go from personal experience and what I have used in the past. I haven't gone for them in in recent years, you know, the past few years. But we did a lot of spin uh, casting and jigging and just you know going after the tuna on the move. And they were usually in the fifty and under class. So you know, down to the the smaller footballs up to about forty five, fifty pounds, maybe sixty pounder every once in a while. We would throw thirty pound, um, and we would get some break offs. So, you know, I, I, I think if you want to go out there and you don't want to have break offs, you're going to be feeling a lot better at 40 or 50 pounds. And look, you're talking braid, so you're not going to have that big of an issue when you're tossing lures. I'm going to assume we're tossing lures in this case. 
if you're tossing lures or top waters for these tuna, you're going to have enough weight on there that you're going to be able to launch it a country mile, no matter what, um, no matter what 50 pound, 30 pound, it's not going to matter at that point when you're throwing several ounces. So, uh, I, I would actually suggest you go up to around the 50 pound and it, you know, it, it gets rid of the concern. Now, if you want the risk of breaking off, you can absolutely land them on 30. You can, you absolutely can. You just might have to retire every once in a while, especially when they go through the school and the school starts ripping through and you start getting the abrasions on the backs of the, of the others in the school, um, that, that can, I mean, that can end it on 50 pounds as well, but it'll definitely end it on a 30 pound quick. All right. So, well, I, you know, I didn't expect to get a tuna question. I love that. I love yeah. getting a tuna question. And on the tunas, though, like you're 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 going to get your best bite sunrise, sunset too, dusk and dawn. Keep that in mind on those tunas. If you're going to target them, first thing in the morning, last thing in the afternoon, man. Yeah, it's funny. We were filming that pier fishing course a couple months ago with uh, Brant over in Navarre, and right. you know we're catching blackfin tuna off pier in that size class. And it's like you know we're trying to get distance to them with that thirty. You want to go low diameter, but it's like every morning. Every single morning, they were out there for like 30 minutes, just like right at sunrise. That was it. That was the only window you got for them during the day. So I would agree with that for sure, man. There's there's something really cool about any any brand of tuna right up against the piers, <laughs> right up against the beach. I love seeing that. All right, next question from OBX Surf and Sound Fishing. Excited about catching gator trout in the Outer Banks area. Would love to know some strategies to find them. If I don't have a boat or kayak, Wyatt, this one's definitely going to be for you because those were your stomping grounds. Yes. So being that you're in the Outer Banks, um, it's it's not necessarily the time of year for it right now. But there's if you don't have a boat or kayak, uh, one of the most popular ways to go catch a giant trout in OBX is to go catch them in the surf in the fall when they are moving in off the beaches from summertime. So they, they move states. And as things start to kind of cool down, they're moving down from Virginia and there's some big fish that come down from Virginia through the Outer Banks, like monstrous fish. And you can catch them during that fall migration as they kind of start to move down towards the Pamlico. Now, if you are in the Outer Banks right now, you want to go catch a trout, you still can do it. You just have to find access on the sound side that you can walk into. And a lot of those big flats out there, you know, you can walk out to them, even if you don't have a kayak, it just takes a little bit of waiting um but what you're going to want to find is northern protection deeper water access to shallow hunting grounds you know you think about these giant trout that have the same metabolism that they did when they were little babies that are sitting there eating all these giant schools of shrimp and shad but now they have a much higher body mass they can't continue to, to move around and hunt like that they have to conserve energy in the winter time so they're having to pick their opportunities where they can winter out these fronts and they'll eat one big meal before the fronts and then sit there and digest it for several days while that front passes. Then once the front's gone, it breaks, it warms back up, their metabolism shoots up, they go in the shallows and they feed again. Your best opportunity to catch a giant trout right now, if you don't have a boat or kayak, go find a northern protection shoreline close to deeper water, go throw big bait fish presentations before or after a front. So once it starts to warm back up after a front or a day or two before a front, when that pressure starts to change, this is a topic I could talk for literally hours on, but that is the shortest, simplest formula I can give to you. Go throw a big bait fish presentation, five inch minimum for those trout. Cause that is the meal that they're looking for. That's going to digest for several days while they wait that front out. So as we're in winter, this is a really good time to go do that. Great answer. I want to ask for one clarification for everyone. You you did mention the northern protected shorelines. Do you want to just go into a little bit more detail for what people should be looking for? Right. So before like a big front is going to pass through, what's going to happen is like the, the winds are going to calm down uh, and there's probably not going to be a lot of uh, a lot of wind that's moving the, the bay waters around. But what those trout that are large and are seasoned, anything that's over 23 inches, I believe. I was literally just looking into a bunch of studies on trout the other day for some insiders. Anything above 23 inches, that fish is at least six or seven years old. 
So it's made it through multiple seasons of very harsh cold fronts. And it knows when that temperature changes, when there's a certain amount of daylight outside, it doesn't know that it's called winter, but it knows when that's, there's that much daylight outside and it feels pressure changes that it's about to get very cold. And it needs to go hide somewhere that is a little bit warmer than the surrounding waters. Because if it sits in water that's colder than another area, it's gonna burn through that meal that it ate before the front a lot faster. So northern winds usually happen in occurrence with a cold front. North winds bring colder weather from the Ar like the Arctic blast that the United States is about to get. Heavy, heavy, heavy north winds that are coming down. So those trout are gonna find deep water close to northern protected shorelines. They're gonna increase as many warmth factors as they can when they're preparing for these fronts to hit. Because if they, if they eat their meals, but they don't sit in an area that's warm enough, they're gonna completely digest that meal before the front's over. And they're gonna, they're gonna start losing the calories that are actually making up their mass. Uh, and that's how you see a lot of trout die during long freezes. Um, just because they, they've consumed all the calories from that meal that they tried to sit there and digest because they weren't in an area that's warm enough. So northern winds are the protected warm areas during fronts that have, you know, heavy northern winds. So northern protected shorelines near deep water. Like I said, I could talk for this on hours. This is my favorite subject <laughs> in for fishing. I love when you talk about this. It's uh, I just find it fascinating. I watch your weekend game plan every week, waiting and hoping that there's a front coming through because you, you go into detail on it. So thank you for that one. Next one up's a, a good one. Matt, I think this one might be a good one for you from Meltac. What's up, fellas? Do y'all fish hard swim baits? And if so, which ones? Well, uh, I fish, I do fish hard baits. Um, and one of them I fish is a wake bait. And uh, I'm a huge fan of a wake bait. I've used just about every kind I can get my hands on, but the one that has been most consistent for me uh, has been a KVD wake bait. And uh, that's, that's about the only hard bait that I use consistently other than a top water, the moonwalker. I throw that till my arm bleeds, but um, other than, other than those, I mean, um, that's the, the wake bait is probably, I don't, I don't fish mirror lures that much, um, or mirror deans that much, I guess. Um, um, so yeah, I guess a, a wake bait would probably be where, where I'm at on the hard bait end. Okay. Wyatt. Yeah, I do fish hard swim baits. I, I did a lot more when I was in the Carolinas cause there was, you know, a lot of, uh, a lot of smaller bait that seemed to work really well with the flash that was on those mirrodines and I'd fish them in that dirty creek water. I'd throw them around a bend, let the current carry them around like a point or out of a creek mouth where like a, on an outgoing tide, trout would be sitting. Uh, and it's just a nice slow presentation um, that sits there and wobbles and it's got a lot of reflection to it. That's where I really like the hard swim baits um, because they, they tend to have a little bit more foil in them. Like these corkies are great, but they, they can really only have sparkle. They don't have the, the really serious flash, which can actually bite you if you're fishing in too clear of water. Um, I, I really like mirrodines and like, like Matt's water or when I was fishing in the Carolinas, like tannic or stained or brown water that you really need more flash to bring attention to that presentation. Um, that's where the hard baits for me come in. Very good answer. All right. And I will say I do use uh, various, I, I'm going to go a little bit, not just in swim baits. I do use hard baits, but I really, unless, in, unless you want to throw a spoon in there, which we don't, um, I really only use them for striped bass up in, in my area. I don't really use them for much else. I will use them occasionally for bluefish, um, even though Despite the the damage that they do and the fact that they can rip through a hundred pack of lures in minutes, I still prefer the soft plastics on a bucktail when I'm fishing for <laughs> bluefish. So I, I happily sacrifice the the dollars uh, to to use the soft plastics. But you know when I'm mainly using you know the mirror lures or mirrodine, I'm using those. I'm using uh, you know anything top water. I, I do like the Moonwalker, uh, but. For the striped bass, we're talking bigger baits, so the bigger pencils, um, spooks, you know, those types of things. So I, I do use them, but it is not what I would consider what I prefer to do. I prefer, even for striped bass, to use the soft baits. 
um, something like a, a large paddle tail, um, you know, because I, I'm mainly jigging and I like, I like working the entire water column with them and, you know, the swim baits are a little too straight for me. I don't feel I have enough flexibility with them, which is not true. It's just my own personal preference. You know, I, I'll stand next to a couple of guys who use them all the time and they'll be hammering fish, but I'm also hammering fish on the other. So, um, I, I use them, but I wouldn't say that they're my favorite for most of the fishing that I do. All right. Um, Here's a question. Now it's a two-parter. Why you may want to jump in on this one. And the the first one is: Do you ever fish around Atlantic Beach, North Carolina? And the the follow-up is: What what color and size bait is going to be most effective in that area? So I did I did some fishing around there. I mean, it it just depends. Like again, when we talk about water clarity, uh, thinking about what bait is primarily found in the Carolinas that we see redfish and trout and flounder commonly feed on. One of the unique bait items that's there that I see, and it's, it's definitely present that in Atlantic, like I, I went up there and I'd fish for flounder and redfish a lot in the marshes during the fall. And what you have there is a lot of pogies that show up, which are big fat bait fish. So I liked big, big paddle tails. Um, I liked white, uh, the, the one thing that you run into is on outgoing tides, you end up with a lot of dirty water on incoming tides. You end up with really clean water. So the white works well in either situation. But what I did find was on outgoing tides, if it did get too dirty, say there was such a big tide swing that it just turned to complete chocolate. Um, I did always try to find an extra way to throw some flash in there. So I'd either put like a redfish magic spinner on there or I'd have an underspin or I would, that's when I would throw a mirrodine if I was fishing for trout or maybe even redfish. Um, for flounder, it's, it, you can still use like just a heavy paddle tail that you're bouncing. I think they key in more on the bounce than anything. But in terms of size, that's gonna depend on time of year. Uh, I would always go up there and fish in the fall because it's, it's, a, it's around that kind of point, that transition area where you see a lot of migrations taking place throughout bay systems and around, you know, as baits coming in or trout are coming in from, uh, from Virginia as they migrate down, which it's very unique to the East coast speckled trout don't migrate between bay systems anywhere else than above than Georgia and up. So I, I used Atlantic beach as a good area to fish in the fall. And I, when I would fish there, I'd always fish really big baits, um, around that four or five, I think I would even use sometimes those paddler Z's from Z-Man when they were making them in the Slam Shady. Uh, I use those uh, a lot when I was fishing for flounder. So up to seven inches, but that was just when I would go there. That's not to say you can't use smaller baits in those zones. Um, there's a lot to talk about there, but that's that's just how I would fish in Atlantic Beach when I was there. Very good. Very good. The, the next question is one that we can probably expand on a little bit, and it's from Drew08. Hey guys, how do y'all find fish in inshore creeks and bayous, uh, which is what he is primarily fishing in? It's the it's the most popular question. How do I find the fish in this specific area? Matt, you want to take the first swing on this one? Yeah, sure. I'll give it a shot. Um, so that's that's I don't do a lot of bayou fishing um, locally, but what I do um, is very marshy uh, here in the Panhandle Big Bend area. Uh, so there are, I, I, I rely on creeks all year. So I'm mainly, um, you know, in, in the winter, that's where I'll be. So pretty much a lot of my reports for the next couple months, especially after this, uh, hard cold front that Wyatt's getting so excited about is on the way. Um, that's where I'm headed. Um, so, you know, fishing those Creek systems, it's all about depth. Uh, because those fish are going to move to comfortable waters and comfortable temperatures and the comfortable temperatures are really going to depend on um, you know the depth of that water and how much good tidal flow it's getting in those areas so the closer you can get to where those uh, creeks and bayous maybe open up during the summer you're going to or to, during the warmer months you're going to be better off during the colder months, uh, pushing into those creeks and bayous is probably what you're going to want to do um, in, in that uh, respect. So um, 
you're you're definitely in a good spot if that's where you're at you know if you're in some creeks and bodies you you just hit um a great spot because you got a lot of options um finding those depth changes is going to be important and um you know paying attention to where where the tidal flow is coming into you know when those temperatures are warm very good um why did you have anything you wanted to add yeah, I mean, the, the biggest thing for me when I fish those types of areas is just looking at inflow outflow and, and Matt kind of touched on it, but just knowing where marshes drain out, where they're going to receive water. And when you think about fish are going to be as lazy as they can possibly be, uh, usually what's going to happen is you're going to see that those main inflow outflow areas for any bayou, any inshore creek, um, they're going to sit near the mouths of those and wait for the current and bait to uh, wait, wait for the current and the tide uh, to bring them food, um, especially in the wintertime when we end up with a lot of negative tides, usually and, and regardless of where you are in the United States, um, north winds tend to move water south and, and everything just kind of gets lower. And then you have a new moon or a full moon that comes around, you end up with negative tides. If you're in fishing inshore creeks, is like my favorite thing to do when I was in the Carolinas was go find a flat that's, you know, two, three foot on you know your average low tide full moon time negative tide winter the whole flat dries up and all those five foot holes on those major inflow outflow areas for creeks all have about 100 redfish in them the size of you know a living room it's crazy uh but then you really start to learn more about the flats that you fish where the major areas of current are when you're standing on it and it's bone dry and it's like oh that's where most of the water moves in and off of this flat. You can look at it on satellite maps and understand it, but then you get a really good sense of how things actually work when you're standing on top of it. You can see all the fish on that flat uh, are in there. So that's my thing when I do when I fish creeks is I always look at where's current moving throughout this entire creek system. It's very complex. You can go down, you know, a hundred different creek mazes and, and find yourself, you know, some of them are successful. Some of them you might get skunked in, but, uh, I, I tend to have the most success just looking at those major current inflow outflow areas for, uh, for coastal creeks. Yeah. I'm, I'm going to agree with that. And I'll, I'll put a little mid Atlantic slant on it for the species that we have. Uh, it's, it's definitely the inlet and the outlet to those Creek systems are, are where you're going to find generally speaking, the, the most fish you're talking striped bass, weak fish, uh, blue fish, flounder fluke. I mean, definitely, or that's where I'm looking. However, don't sleep on the deep bends. So once you get in, in a creek system and you have a dramatic bend, and I'm talking 90 degrees or better, uh, almost the, the more severe the bend, the better. And look on the outside of that. And that's usually, not always, but usually where the deep part of it, of it is. You're going to have in the colder weather, you're going to have the fish sitting down in there, uh, especially during the day and maybe feeding up on the shallow side. But also look for the current seams. You'll see whether the current is faster on the outside and it gets slowed down on the inside. And, uh, you know, in the mid-Atlantic, you can get very effective fishing time in if you're fishing along those seams on both sides, on the, the fast current and on the slow current side. But again, I'd start at the mouth or the exit of that, depending on which way the tide is flowing. Fish those points first, but then head in and, and go back into those creeks and, and take a look at those bends. You'll often find... You know, if you find them there, they're usually stacked. They're usually just schools stacked in one place, especially striped bass. Weak fish, you know, I'll I'll take weak fish out of there. They're not going to be quite as stacked as the others, but you'll still find them in there as the uh, the second choice. All right, next question from Turner Randall. I've been catching a lot of my fish recently in the Jacksonville Intercoastal on Redfish Magic. What are some instances I shouldn't throw like too shallow or so on and so forth? So, Matt, uh, either of you can take it. Yeah. I mean, uh, I guess the day of a front or like the day that, you know, the temperature just dropped, those fish are usually going to get a little bit deeper and a redfish magic, you know, those lures are designed to be fished in really shallow water. Um, so I find that, it, most of the heads on those things are, I think they're anywhere from an eighth to maybe three sixteenths. They don't go much heavier than that. And then the blade that's on those generally keeps them running a little bit shallower. It's hard to fish them and get the action that they're designed to give, which is really just a spinnerbait, constant retrieve. Uh, if you're looking for fish that are in 
deeper water. So you first need to think about where you're targeting fish, where they're going to be based on the conditions. So if you had a cold front come through that night and then you go fishing the following morning, those fish just dropped off in deeper water and you're going to need to jig like jig those depth changes with quarter ounce, half ounce heads, um, like shrimp presentations that are on the bottom, something slow bounce. Um, you know, I, I would say just in terms of not throwing too shallow uh, the day of, uh, but once it warms back up and those fish move up into the shallows again, because the bait's moving up in the shallows to warm back up, that could be great. If you've got a big, you know, big paddle tail attached to that, uh, fish looking for a high calorie meal could be a good option. What do you think, Matt? Yeah, um, all good things. Definitely not uh, too shallow has never been an option for me for a spinner bait. Uh, I, about three weeks ago, or no, maybe it was about a month ago now. Uh, even one of the guys that's in the chat here with us watching the live, Charlie Ray, was on a fishing trip with me, one of our insider members, and I caught an overslot. I caught a 31 inch redfish in what was maybe a foot of water. Um, and it just on a mud, mud bank off of a Creek system. So, um, you know, they, they'll eat it, uh, crazy shallow. I've said, and, uh, he was with me and I'm running it over top of oyster bars that are maybe eight inches deep and redfish are coming up to hit it there too. Um, banging or running across the top of oyster bars and letting that spinner bait hit the bottom of it. That's a great way to trigger a bite because once it comes off that ledge, that's where they're sitting. Um, but just like Wyatt said, post cold front, they're going to sit hard bottom. They are not going to be moving around for those, uh, for those. They're going to want it right in front of their face as easy as they can get it. Um, because they're, they're doing everything they can to save calories at that point. So they are not chasing baits. Um, and you got to have it right there in front of them. So, uh, spinner baits are really, really designed for when those fish are really in active feeding mode, you know, and they're, they're going to go get a, get a bite. They're going to go get an eat. Um, so if, if you can't really present it in front of their face, spinner baits, not really the, the optimal lure, I, I would say. I think you said something that is worth circling back to when you and Charlie Ray were fishing, you were catching them on a mud bank close to oysters. And then you said hard bottom as well. Being that we're in winter, something that I think a lot of, I, whenever I tell people this, they're like, whoa, I never thought about it that way. Oyster bars, like you guys were fishing, serve as like space heaters for fish in the winter time. Cause that sun hits those dark oysters and generally they're further off the bottom um, than, than the actual bottom is. So they warm up a lot faster, hard bottom, you know, if it's rocks or if it's uh if it's some substrate that's not like sand or grass, it stays warm. It holds heat more. And those fish, when they lay on the bottom, you'll pick them up. Like you'll catch trout and they have mites on the bottom of them like flounder do. And it's, that tells you they're right there on the bottom. So if there's a bottom that's warmer, they're sitting around an oyster bar that's radiating heat because it's dark shell. Those are areas you're going to find fish in the wintertime a lot more mud as well as it's darker bottom will will tend to be a little bit warmer so those are all other things to think about on where you pick where you're going to go fishing that's the number one thing is 90 10 zone before you pick any lure or you know how shallow or whatever you throw it where are the fish going to be and then you start making decisions on the rest of your presentation very good i'm not going to add to that because i have never fished that lure and uh redfish aren't really that common where i am although i do fish for them throughout the at various times all right this question is from short stack what's a really good inshore setup this is a loaded and a half question uh, matt you have the most setups of anyone i know just on your kayak at all times so why don't you go through the basics why you can hit yours for your area and then i'll hit a couple for my area oh man i don't i don't even know how to start um <laughs> Uh, so let's start with this. It depends on what you're targeting first, uh, what you're targeting and where you're targeting it. Those are, those are probably the two most important factors right there. As far as, you know, what, what you're looking for. I don't have snook up here in my area. I, I just caught one a couple months ago, but I don't find them up here. So I don't have to worry about pulling snook out of mangroves where my friends rely on heavy and medium heavy gear 
so that as soon as they get that bite, set that hook, that fish is coming out of there. Um, I got wide open space. The most thing I got to worry about is some moisture bars or, you know, maybe some, some stick ups or some grass. I break, I break off in saw grass here. Um, it's happened to me more than once. Um, but you know, so, um, it's different. It depends on where you're targeting. So I'm normally comfortable with giving fish a little bit of drag, probably a little bit more than say somebody would be around a dock or a mangrove line. Um, because they're worried about that fish getting in that structure. So, uh, they want a rod or some gear, uh, per se, that's going to get them out of that structure fast. Me, it's 10 pound J braid and it's 20 pound Andy mono all day, all year. And let me tell you, they love it. So, um, my, and I'm using all of that on a medium rod, medium power rod for just about 90% of the stuff I do. When I pick up bigger gear, it's cause I'm going out of town. Um, but it's, uh, it's, um, you know, usually medium power, fast action. I like seven foot and seven, six rods. It just depends on the rod. Each rod is different. You really just got to find what works for your fishing style. Uh, what I, what I like to use may be considered a wet noodle, uh, by Luke because he fishes a lot of docks and he likes a, a, a rod that's got, um, a bit more of a um, heavier action. You know, it's, it's got the Khmer power to get those big snook out of those docks when he's uh, pitching that power prawn under there. So, you know, it's, it's just all about where you're fishing, what you're targeting and uh, you know, really preference. I sit really low, so I don't want a rod that can't bend because I'm in a kayak. I need a rod that has some give to it. If that rod does not have enough deflection, I could number one, break my rod or number two, the fish could shake uh, the hook of whatever it is he's on because that rod is providing too much tension on the hook in the fish's mouth. So loaded question. I mean, that's a podcast alone. I'm going to yeah. end it right there um, because I, I just like you said, I got eight rods. I could go for days, man. Days. you have eight in the kayak i don't even want to know how <laughs> yeah, many you have in the yeah. garage that's fair that no oh, that's fair <laughs> that's I, nobody wants to know that uh especially not my financial advisor but uh <laughs> uh yeah so i can tell you that it's all about preference and lure pref or lure choice plays a big part into that as well you know so it's there's there's a whole lot going on here so um find find what what you like you know to do what you like to target where you like to do it and find something that works best for that that's the best response i feel like i could give very good why yeah it, it it's it can be very complex i usually look at my rod selection as is you know what is this rod for uh first it's you know am i fishing artificial lures with it am i fishing live bait with it that's usually the first question i ask i've got a bunch of rods sitting over here in the corner, I got a bunch of rods sitting over here. You know, you really need to look at what it is you want to do. Generally, I do try to separate it based on species. Trout, I go with lighter action rods. Uh, this is outside of length, everything, like just going from redfish to trout, I like a lighter action rod because a trout that's shaking his head, flinging one of these things around that's really heavy, good chance he's going to sling it out of his mouth if I don't have a rod that can give him that head shake back. With a redfish, I'm going to be sitting there and fighting him for 10, 15 minutes on that same rod. I need a medium rod to land a redfish in a respectable amount of time to get back to fishing um, without my arms starting to cramp up. So you also then need to think about, okay, for this, this rod, for this application, for this species, what lure, like Matt said, is it going to be used for? I have topwater rods. I have swim bait rods. I have porky rods. I have all these things. That's all, you know, that all plays into it. I'd say the rod that I tend to just play generalist with, if I go out there, like on a weight, I can only bring one rod with me. Generally, it's my TFO, medium fast, 7.6. 7.6 is a good balance of accuracy and distance. I think 7, you lose a little bit of distance but you gain an impressive amount of accuracy like if you're skipping person shorter rods are important i weighed open flats but i also need to be able to i do a lot of sight casting like honestly for as much sight casting as i do i might like 
I might need to go down to a shorter rod if that's what I know I'm going to be doing for the majority of the day. But a lot of times I start out, I go walk two, three miles. I don't know what's going to happen in that span of time. So I usually just go with seven, six, medium, fast, TFO, 2,500 reel, 10 pound braid with 20 pound mono or fluoro. Uh, if I'm trout fishing, I'll use fluoro because I'm weird. And uh, there's a conspiracy out there that fish can't see it as well. And there's no science behind it, but if it, if it might help me catch a bigger trout, I'm going to do it. So I, uh, I, I don't usually play around with too many other variables in that, but your rod is going to be your biggest, most important factor in all of that. And I think if you're throwing artificial lures, get something light, but get something balanced. You know, you don't want to have the most ultra light set up out there, but you want something that you can throw and have good balance with, but it also not fatigue you so that you can fish comfortably all day. So there's, there's like Matt said, you can have a whole, whole podcast on this. Um, yep. Good question. Good, good question. Good answers. I'll, I'll put mine in real quick. I'll say that the, uh, I don't, I don't use a lot of different rods, uh, throughout the year. I, I tend to, um, try to limit the amount of rods that I, I bring out, um, onto the water. So I'm not, I'm not bringing, you know, uh, eight rods, I'm bringing four max. And, uh, what I'm looking at right now, my favorite rod right now is actually a TFO professional S or TFO pro S and I am using medium heavy. Uh, and I believe it's a fast action. I do like fast action and I do like the medium heavy because of the fact that we're using much larger lures in the mid Atlantic and Northeast. Uh, we had a, a salt strong meeting earlier and Luke was talking about, you know, deep water was over two and a half feet. And I'm thinking, that's not even deep enough to launch, you know, the kayaks up here, two and a half feet. You're like, do I have enough water? Um, you know, deep water to us is, you know, in the backwaters is 25, 30 down to 60 feet, just in the backwaters where we're fishing for flounder, specifically striped bass. Usually I'm not fishing those areas, but it's, it's common. So you need something that you can drop a one, one and a half, two ounce bucktail or jig down to the bottom. And for that reason, I'm looking at lighter braid. So I'm looking at 15 pound or 10 pound. The thinner the braid, the easier it is when you're vertical jigging, which again is more of a mid-Atlantic northern thing. The vertical jigging in the backwaters, the current's not going to take it as far. So you want to go down in the in that, that pound test. So 10 pound test is going to land anything. I have plenty of video of me landing 40, upper 40 inch striped bass on 10 pound. Use a 20 pound Andy mono, mono uh, leader for pretty much everything in short, unless I'm fishing for tog in extremely heavy structure, in which case I, I will up it to 40 pound and tog don't care about leaders. So you just need something that's going to take that, take that, that rock or that wreck and give you a shot at getting that fish out of there. Um, and as far as the reels, whatever balance is on the rod, I'm a fan of pen. Uh, I also do fish and have Daiwa. Um, so just look for something that's in the price range that you like. Uh, but I do, you know, I, I am really enjoying for most of the mid Atlantic stuff that I'm doing that TFO pro it's a, it's a, it's a good budget rod as well. All right. Next question. Uh, next question is actually for me, but, um, it's going to go into another one. I'm going to put two back to back. This one is from Larry. Rich, do you plan to attend the Garden State Outdoor Show in January? Be a great opportunity for exposure for me and Salt Strong. So I actually do plan on attending as an attendee, not as a Salt Strong representative or anything like that. But I do like to go to the shows. Uh, normal co-host Ed also likes to go to the shows. So I may see you there. I'll be wandering around and you can be sure I'll be wearing my Salt Strong gear. I will say that there is a tentative plan right now for me to attend uh, and for Salt Strong to have a booth at another local show in the spring, but I'm not going to go any further than that until it's confirmed. So there may be a Salt Strong booth up in the uh, New Jersey, Pennsylvania, New York area in one of the shows coming up soon. But that also leads into another question, which I don't have ready to throw up there, but I'm going to just throw it out there because I believe it was for you, Matt. And the question is meetups. Um, for those that are not members of the insider club, we do meetups where we basically put the call out there and say, look, I'm going to be fishing in this area or I'm going to be in this area. Let's get as many members as possible together. And you'll either just hang out before everybody hits the water and scatters, 
Sometimes everyone will jump on a charter or a party boat. Sometimes everyone will hit the beach or the pier together. It just depends. Matt, do you have any that are coming up that you uh, that you can talk about or any that you're, you know, in the tentative stages for? Yes, I don't have a, I don't have a date right now, but uh, the plan is uh, as far as what I'm trying to do is do something either the last weekend of January or the first weekend of February um, for uh, just whoever would like to come. We're going to pick a launch location. Everybody's welcome to come fish, hang out. Um, and then afterwards, we'll just go get something to eat, kind of fellowship and, um, you know, get to just hang out and get to uh, it's a good way for other people in the insider community to get to kind of make personal connections amongst themselves um you know so uh myself just kind of share personally uh one of my best friends in this entire world is a guy i met in the salt strong community um and i met him just because of a post that i made in the community um so uh robert courtney if you're listening that's my man um he's one of our insider members and he uh you know was engaged in the community and that's how i met him you know i made a post and he said yeah i'm local we can go fish um, and you know, that's how our community works, you know, and I want to help kind of facilitate some more, um, you know, local engagement like that within, uh, our members, you know, locally. So, you know, they know that even though, you know, maybe if I'm not there, I can't make it to the water. That doesn't mean that they can't get up and go together as well, but I plan on doing something again. I just had one, um, not too long ago and went fishing with a couple members recently as well. Um, so, but I plan on doing something again, uh, hopefully, as I said, uh, last weekend in January or first weekend in February here, um, within the, um, you know, say a uh, 30 minute drive of Wakulla County, somewhere in that area. Why do you have anything planned? You're, you're extremely busy. You're, you're the busiest coach, uh, there is, um, you have anything that that's tentatively planned at least? Yeah, so we do have a meetup that's going to be happening in February in Rockport. That's a little north of me, but great, great fishing area um, has everything to offer us in terms of Texas fishing. In fact, I think my first slam I ever caught in Texas was in Rockport, uh, and it was right after the freeze. So uh, it'll be right after cold weather, same conditions, come out, catch a slam in Rockport. I think Pat will be there as well, um, but it'll be good. There's, there's great trout fishing in Rockport in February. Uh, the reds start to get fired up, get all over Estes Flats. We're gonna we're gonna probably set up a big old wade line. That's always been my goal. Is I want to see how many insiders I can get in one wade line on the flats. Like I just got to find a flat that can host enough people along a good fishing stretch. And it happens where there's like redfish that spread out on a flat, and you can fit sixty people that are just you know good distance away from each other. But I just want to see just a line of sixty people. Just bam, 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 bam. bam. That's the goal to do that in February. Awesome. All right. And I, I have tried to do a couple. Um, we started off with New Jersey just because it was, uh, there were a bunch of people that wanted to go and we tried to get on right now. Look, everybody that's not up in the mid Atlantic or New Jersey, New York. Um, when I went out the other day, I guess on yeah Sunday, it was, uh, it was snowing on the way down and it was, you know, 30 mile an hour winds in the mid thirties. And, uh, a lot of these, you know, so I'm not going to go out on the kayak right now. And uh, we tried to do a, a tog trip and the boats just sell out so quickly. So it's really tough. We had people that wanted to go and couldn't go. We're going to try, uh, I think, down in Maryland in a few weeks. I'm, I'm looking at options there and talking to some captains to see if we can reserve some spots ahead of time. Uh, and then we're definitely going to do things up in New York. New Jersey, Delaware, Maryland throughout the, throughout the spring. So more to come on that, but yeah, it's a good time. And, uh, I I'm looking forward to, to having one, but we don't have an exact one on the schedule and I'll get one as soon as I can get a captain that, uh, has some ideas on how we can ensure that we can get multiple people onto the same trip. So, all right. So we're, we're coming up close to the, to the end of this. I, I want to put one more. And again, this is, I know we've talked about this already, but Nicholas has, you know, the question, and this is Georgia, but non-typical cold weather coming in this week. Any tips for fishing during the cold front? We have to hit that because literally every single region 
is going to be going through this. If you haven't, well, we've all done it twice in the past week, but we're, we got a big one and it's going to hit everybody. So uh, let's let's just wrap up on this question and make sure we really get into detail on it. What's the what's the approach going to be for fishing during the cold front coming up? I know you want to say it, Wyatt. So go ahead. I, I, I've attacked these. Yeah. Uh, all right. So the big thing here is metabolism. We need to think about metabolism. Fish, it's not like fish get cold and they don't enjoy the cold like we do. And we put on flannels or fancy jackets like Matt has on. And they are struggling with a different problem. And that's their metabolism. When they get cold, their body is now having to literally, you know, heat itself up and consume calories like it's it's its body is throwing enzymes into its stomach to burn up and digest that food so that it can literally conserve its body weight and it doesn't like eat itself alive so these fish pre-front are going to absolutely like guys before this front hits it's going to happen in every state it's going to come down and the pressure is going to change and it's going to start in the you know virginia carolinas um Georgia, Florida, it's going to happen through tech. Like it's all going to come down. And regardless of where you are, the day before you get those crazy freaking north winds and that temperature drops from that Arctic blast, those fish are going to go off. Like get to an area that's close to where there's going to be that northern protection from those north winds. There's going to be deeper water. Like you got to combine all these factors. Deep water is probably the most important, even if there's not northern protection. Um, try to find deep water near Northern protection. If there's muddy bottoms, fresh water outflow areas are good because lower salinity generally is warmer water. Um, further back in the bay system, further away from the passes and inlets, you need to get away from cold Gulf or cold Atlantic water, get further back in the basins. If you're in the Carolinas, Virginia, you're back in the river systems. You're in the Pamlico river. You're in Swan, you're in Swan quarter. You're in you know, those Virginia beach rivers that run all the way back, you know, those are all those big trout are right now. My boys in Virginia, you've got some serious trout fishing coming. I know it. I talked to the guys up there. It's going to be crazy. But regardless of where you are, those fish are going to be looking for high calorie meals to digest through the front, throw big top waters, throw big subsurface presentations, throw big paddle tails, bounce big baits off the bottom. Any big presentations you have, that's what those fish are going to be after and find areas where there's shallow water feeding near those deep zones where those fish are going to hold and digest food and, and wait, and not move. Um, but this, this is going to be a longer front longer than it usually is. So after a couple days of cold weather, if it starts to not be as cold, even if it's a slight shift, you might see a little bit of feeding in deep water. What ideally will happen, which I, the forecast is, is not far enough out yet to see this, but if it's a quick front and it warms up, you know, three, four days after, whenever that front breaks and you hit, you know, 60, 70 degree air temperature again, that water is going to start to warm up. If the clouds go away, sun comes out, warms the shallows, those fish are going up there to attack the bait that's doing the exact same thing and replenish those calories because this is all driving around what their metabolism is doing. They can't continue to sit in that deep water if it's super cold and burn that furnace without putting more fuel in it. So they're going to go back up to the shallows and feed so that they're able to keep that metabolic rate going. Um, trout are the most susceptible to this. Redfish, I see them go deep and they're a little bit more sluggish about moving around. Trout are a lot more proactive. Um, their, their skin is not as thick as a redfish's. And I, I think they, I've seen some studies on this. They're way more susceptible to colder temperatures than drum or redfish are. So they'll be the first ones to be proactive about moving and feeding more heavily than redfish will, but you'll see the same thing happen. Um, Rich, I don't know if you can touch on what will happen with stripers or anything. I don't know. Can you fish for them right now? Oh yeah. Yeah. So we have, let's just use, I'll just use Atlantic city as, you know, kind of in the middle of the mid Atlantic and Northeast region as an example. So, so we're, just looking at temperatures, right? I, I haven't looked at barometer and, and any of those forecasts, but you can tell that stuff's moving because we're highs of, you know, 40 are now going to jump up to mid fifties on Thursday and Friday. And then it's going to drop down to 27 through the weekend. So all the way through Christmas. So those are when your fronts are coming. So you, you're going to have, you're going to have some interesting 
conditions. But the thing to keep in mind is we have the deeper water and we don't really have the, the confu or the, the consideration that the, the striped bass and as an example are going to starve. Uh, -uh. they're gorging on these menhaden. So wherever the menhaden are, they're going to be eating. You can still catch them. If they, if it does get too cold, if this 27, actually that usually wakes them up and they get more active, but, uh, let's say that does send them deep. Well, they're just deep and they'll, they'll still, they'll still be feeding. They'll just be feeding deep. Remember this is their fall migration. So you're going to be in good shape for them. And wherever you're for most areas, I believe you're still going to be able to catch them in the backwaters. I would be looking in inlets, uh, specifically, especially when you hit that cold snap, when it hits 27 on Saturday, Christmas Eve. Uh, and if you're allowed to go fishing Christmas Eve and Christmas, you're, you're going to be wanting to look inlets if you're going to talk backwaters and uh otherwise just start looking for that men hating and we're gonna have the return to west winds so you know by sunday by christmas day they they should be pushing right right down as as normal as for the tog i don't think they really care as long as that bottom is not churned up to where they can't see anything you should have a uh, decent ability to hook and catch them the question is can you get on the water and it's not looking like you're going to be able to get very far with southwest winds at 30 miles per hour it's not going to happen. So uh, you're going to have to wait till Saturday to, to really do that. So we, we have a, a little bit of a different consideration. It does change their behavior. They do feed more when the, that barometer starts to drop. They go crazy, uh, but they will continue to feed simply because we're talking fall migration. If we we're talking the middle of the summer, I would have a different answer for you on how they're going to behave because they will stop feeding. But as long as there's a big school a mile long of men hating coming through, every striped bass is, is probably going to be gorging itself as much as possible. I think what's important here is, you know, you're talking about water, you know, you said they'll feed deeper. Well, will we talk about our inshore bay systems that, you know, most of the base, the bay systems I fish for trout max 20 feet in depth. Most of the feeding areas that these trout are in the flats I'm walking around on why I do so much wade fishing. These are expansive flats, miles and miles of two, three foot of water. So their metabolic rate in that shallower water that's warmer is consistently higher. Right. So you talked about those tog feeding more in colder water. It's the same principle. Once it gets colder, they need to they need to start burning. They need to eat more to you know make up for those calories that they're losing from the cold water. These fish that you know are consistently sitting in two three foot of water that are warmer, you know they have a very high rate, and then to have to adjust and really slow that down and regulate it. I was reading studies from Texas Parks and Wildlife. Trout regulate their, their metabolic rate um, inshore more than any other species by adjusting their environment, uh, adjusting depth, adjusting where they're sitting in terms of salinity and, you know, cover and things like that. It's, it's because they're, they're sitting in shallower water much more. So their, their metabolic rates change at a much more drastic rate i believe so that's that's something interesting this is why it's always really important to learn about other fisheries because you can you can really learn and it, it just it goes to prove the point that the colder temperatures you know they have to make up for those calories that they're going to lose fish that consistently sit deep that's a that's a flat rate they just have to start eating more fish that could not sustain that rate they just have to move and completely shut down so that's very interesting to sit there and compare and contrast yeah, it's that old thing where, you know, I said it before and I forget who I, I'm not the one who made it up, but they can't go to, they can't go to the, the stop and go. They can't go to Acme. They can't go to whatever grocery store is in their area when they're hungry. If they get the munchies, they better go find something and it be, they better expend less calories getting their food than they're expending to get it or else they're going to die. So it's an entirely different existence than us. And, uh, and, and you have to keep that in mind. It's, they're not just going to eat your bait going by because they saw it. You know, you talked about the spinner baits, just ripping a spinner in front of a fish in cold water is not necessarily going to get it to move because it's looking at it saying it's three inches and not enough calories for me to go launch after it and chase it for 20 yards. It's just going to sit there and wait for something. that's a little slower, a little easier. If it just comes by and just happens to drop in front of my face, I may suck it up and, and, you know, get the quick meal and, and you have to th try to think like a fish wing you can. I know it's weird, but it's what you have to do. And the more that you know about the species and the more you know about the bait fish that are in that area, the better you're going to understand where to find them. So uh, any last thoughts before we go, Matt, do you have any last thoughts that you want to share? 
uh, I can't um, really say anything. Uh, what Wyatt said was um, super uh, true. I know. I know that I'm going to be doing the exact same thing as soon as I, I. I. That's what I was actually sitting here doing. I was looking at what the actual last minute I can hit the water is. And yeah. it's blowing 16, and there's going to be a negative tide first thing that morning. But if I hit the water at noon, I should have just enough, uh, just enough time to get a good bite in that afternoon. And I know that that's going to be those fish's last opportunity coming into that negative tide off of. Um, for this is my area, so this is probably going to be in my weekend game plan. A little foresight right here. So coming off of this negative tide, knowing that that pressure system's dropped the, on that day, I'm going to have to plan to look for water, launch later, um, and those fish are going to be pushing in with that water to go gorge on all of that bait that's in that shallow water that they couldn't get to. And as soon as that tide drops out on that outgoing cycle, those fish are gone. Those fish are go gone. There's, I'm not, no bait. No predatory fish, no nothing. So that's what I was just looking at myself. Um, Wyatt just nailed it dead on the head. Um, so as soon as you know, if you can, you can do it yourself real easy, look at what the weather's going to be. Uh, my temperature drops uh, into the teens. So, uh, you know, and, and it does so overnight, um, 50 degrees overnight. So, um, or excuse me, 40 degrees overnight. It's in the 50s the, the day before. So, I know that that last day when it's in the fifties and it's even actually going to be warmer than the day before, which is that pressure system changing. I know that's my window. So that's what I have to add right there. Why it's spot on a little bit, a little bit of local knowledge. And if you're not already an insider member and you want to hear us dive into that more, definitely check us out at soulstrong.com. Shameless plug right there. Yep. That is a shameless plug, <laughs> but you know, and so we're going to wrap it up, but I do want to say, you know, I, I will piggyback on that and say, uh, we didn't get to all the questions this time. And if you are a salt strong insider, go into the community, post your question with the ask a coach, uh, tag on there and we'll answer them as quickly as po possible. Either one of the three of us or one of the other coaches. We'll jump in and you know a lot of the people in the community will jump in and answer as well uh, if you're not a member you should check it out i'm just going to leave it at that there's no hard sell here but you should check it out because this conversation is really the information that we're sharing inside the, the community throughout the day every day of the year um, and it's not just us you know we've got some incredible members captains experts people that pretend they're not experts but they are uh, in the community and just a lot of giving and a lot of give and take. So we're going to leave it at that. And the last thing I'm going to say is everybody get out there this weekend. If you can, without getting in trouble, get on the water, get some tight lines and have a Merry Christmas from all of us here and all of Salt Strong. We'll catch you on the next one in two weeks. We're going to be off next Monday. We're not going to do this on the holidays. So everyone enjoy your time with your family and friends and we'll see you soon.